In today's news, there's an upcoming solar eclipse. We'll help you get prepared for this amazing event. This is STEM, STEM in 30. 30. Hello and welcome to the STEM in 30 News. I'm Beth Wilson. And I'm Marty Kelsey. And in the next 30 minutes, we're going to get you all of the science, technology, engineering, and math that you could need. Our top story is the total solar eclipse. There's a total solar eclipse passing over the United States on April 8th, 2024. The total eclipse passes over Mexico, through Dallas, Indianapolis, Cleveland, and then into Canada. But don't worry, if you're not in the path of totality, it will still be an amazing experience. In today's news, we're going to learn all about what makes an eclipse, how to view it safely, and what you can do before, during, and after the eclipse. Total solar eclipses are complex astronomical events that happen fairly often, between two to four times yearly. Only eight have passed over the United States since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Eclipses are rare because they involve the movement of the Earth and the Moon around the Sun and require the proper alignment to produce totality. Let's head over to our friends, the Harlem Globetrotters, to learn more about the movements of the Earth and the Moon. Hey everybody, I'm Julian Zeus McClurkin of the world famous Harlem Globetrotters. Let's imagine for a second that this basketball is Earth. It spins on its axis, an imaginary line running down the middle. This is called rotate. Earth rotates on its axis like this. And this is Darnell Speedy Artis with our moon. The man on the moon. The moon spins on its axis. It's rotating just like the Earth. The moon spins a lot slower than the Earth, but we're gonna do it faster because it's just way more fun that way. Not only is the moon rotating, it also orbits or revolves around the Earth. That means it goes around the Earth. I fell off the axis. Time to get a little more complex. Look over here at the sun. The Earth revolves around the sun all the while it's still rotating and the moon is rotating on its axis and orbiting around the earth at the same time. That means the whole cosmic neighborhood is moving. All of this moving, rotating and orbiting, that affects what we can see in the night sky. So remember, spinning on the axis is rotating. Moving around an object, that's called revolving. See? And this is out of this world. Ha! As the moon continues to revolve around the Earth, an eclipse is heading our way. Wait, wait, breaking news, breaking news. This just in, eclipses come in two different varieties, both lunar and solar. Here's more on that story. An eclipse is a brief but amazing event in the sky when the sun or moon gets blocked or darkened. A solar eclipse happens when the sun is blocked by the moon. During the eclipse, you can see the sun gradually disappear as the moon passes in front of it. If you are located in the right part of the earth, you will see the moon block the entire sun and the whole sky darken for a few minutes. The time when the sun is totally covered is called total solar eclipse. Let's look at this from another perspective, out in space. We can see the sun shining onto the moon and the earth. As the moon passes by the earth, it blocks a little bit of sunlight and casts a shadow onto our planet. Anyone located inside that shadow would see the moon perfectly lined up with the sun, totally blocking the sun's light. People outside that shadow would see the moon only partially covering the sun. What causes a lunar eclipse? A lunar eclipse happens when the moon is darkened by the shadow of the Earth. 
We are used to seeing the moon go through phases, which are caused by the changing angle of the sun and not the shadow of the earth. But during an eclipse, we see the moon slowly disappear as the earth blocks sunlight from reaching it. If the moon passes completely inside the earth's shadow, it goes totally dark with only a faint red glow. This is a total lunar eclipse, sometimes called a blood moon. To see what's causing the red glow, let's take a look from the moon's perspective. The earth is blocking any direct sunlight from reaching the moon, but a small amount of light shines through the earth's atmosphere where the blue colors are absorbed and only the red light makes it through. This filtered red light from the atmosphere shines onto the moon, giving it the soft red color. We don't see solar and lunar eclipses every month. As the moon goes around the Earth, its orbit is slightly tilted with respect to the sun. That means that most of the time, when the moon passes in front or behind the Earth, it's a little too high or low to be perfectly aligned with the sun. A couple times per year, its orbit will put it at just the right angle to line up with the sun and create an eclipse. By carefully measuring the orbits of the moon and Earth, we can predict when the alignment will be just right for an eclipse to happen. Will the sun be eaten by a giant mythical dragon on April 8th? More on that story tonight at 11. We're getting more breaking news. It is anticipated that millions of people will be staring at the sun on April 8th. Beth, that, that's okay as long as they do it safely. Right you are, Marty. There are a lot of safe ways to view and experience the eclipse. Let's get those eclipse glasses ready and make sure we are all safe on Eclipse Day. We are now joined by Lisa Pitts and Paula Eschbach, who are members of the National Air and Space Museum's Teacher Innovator Institute. Paula, Lisa, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks for having us on. We're so excited to join you today. Where are you both located and what are you expecting from the eclipse? I am in a town, Upper Arlington, which is a suburb of Columbus, Ohio. And Upper Arlington itself is not in the path of totality. My plan is to make it to our totality path and experience 100%. So I'm really looking forward to experiencing the lead up with the partial eclipse, experiencing that total eclipse, and then coming down from that moment, getting another portion of a partial eclipse. Hi, I'm in Oklahoma City. And we're about 95%. So we don't get the total eclipse, but we're so close. And our school is very excited about this event. So we are already prepared to take most of the day off to go outside and see um, the event happen. We have the solar eclipse glasses and the kids are already getting pumped about it. What are your students doing leading up to the eclipse? Leading up to the solar eclipse, our students are learning about moon phases and we're looking at this natural phenomenon of the earth, moon and sun system together. We want our kids to understand what's happening and um, just really kind of dig deep into that science concept. So we'll do some activities with um, modeling the moon phases. We'll do some modeling of the solar eclipse and then they'll have this understanding when we get to the event. And we started this as a partnership so that we could join our two classes being so close to the path of totality. 
We started off by a mystery Zoom where our kids got to meet each other and figure out which locations we both were in. And then we've moved on to actually writing pen pal letters back and forth with each other. The hope is that when we actually get to the day of the eclipse, we'll take some um, measurements using our pocket lab that we have. Students will collect data on the Lux light and figure out what changes. And then we will reconvene back together with both classes, talking about what were the changes that we saw in my city in Upper Arlington and Lisa City in Oklahoma as well. What about during the eclipse? Some other data we're going to collect will be the temperature change. Will it get colder? Will it stay the same? We're also going to listen for animal noises and we're going to observe using our senses. As we've been going and preparing for this activity, we've looked and tried to give our students some experiences with collecting data on shadows in general and trying to make the connections of how that relates to the eclipse and the process that we'll see. What will your students be doing with the data they collect after the eclipse? So after the eclipse, we are going to have our students figure out the change in temperature, as well as note any differences that they were able to see, hear, or experience, and then share that in small groups with each other's classrooms. The hope is that we'll find that maybe there'll be something completely different, or maybe we find really similar results. That's the really great part. We're not quite sure what we'll experience with 95% or 90% versus being in totality if there's a huge difference or very small or none at all. Our students have really enjoyed getting together and connecting with Paula's class. So with the pen pal letters, they're writing back and forth, getting to know each other so that when we do meet, after we've collected this data, um, in our small groups, then they'll be able to talk to each other, they'll know each other a little bit, and we're hoping they have connections for life through this experience. How can other teachers get their students activated during the eclipse? All right, one of the great things that both myself and Lisa are very passionate about is showing our students that they have a vital role in collecting data. Being a part of the citizen science movement is really something we've looked at this year. And so my students are gonna have the opportunity to not only collect data through the pocket lab, but we have also, um, partnered up with the GLOBE program that they can record through an app what they will experience with the temperature and it will then show a greater map of where they are and all the other citizens of the United States that are taking data that day. So the hope is that we will start to compare in just our small community, look to Lisa's community and then global and or nationwide to see what we're looking at and how it compares to everybody else. In addition to collecting um, the temperature and the light changes, we're going to use the Eclipse Soundscape Observer from NASA and collect some field notes. And during this, we're going to listen for insects and mammals and um, people, reptiles, just different animals. And we're going to use our senses and look around us. Did they notice a light change? Did they notice quiet? Did they notice more noise? and they're going to record it. And the field guide is available online, as well as if you don't have a pocket lab, you can use your phone. It has a Lux sensor in there where you can record um, the amount of light. You can also use your temperature um, sensor on your phone to record if there's a temperature change. We did not get to experience the annular eclipse at school because it was on a Saturday. So our students are so excited to get to experience this at school and collect data and compare it with Paula's classroom. But you know what? Whether you're at 95% totality, 5%, get out there and experience it. Take your kids outside in a safe manner with glasses, or you can use a colander or punch holes in paper, or use a sun spotter of some kind, but get out there and experience this amazing phenomenon that's going to happen. Thanks so much for joining us today. We are wishing you sunny skies on April 8th. Thanks so much for having us today. It was such a pleasure to share what we're doing with our classrooms. We are excited about this. We are excited to share our data. We are excited to connect and we hope you enjoy this experience. Strange and eerie things are coming to a town near you. Historically, eclipses have caused panic among people. Roosters crow because they think it's morning. Other animals just act weird. Temperatures change as it gets amazingly dark. 
we will talk about experiencing an eclipse because it is so much more than just viewing it. It's truly a sensory experience, and whether you are in totality or not, you can participate in citizen science. Do you plan on enjoying the solar eclipse? If you are, then NASA wants you to become a citizen scientist. Citizen science projects call upon members of the public to volunteer in the scientific process. Citizen scientists address real-world problems in ways that may include formulating research questions, conducting scientific experiments, collecting and analyzing data, making new discoveries, and solving complex problems. These projects are collaborations between trained scientists and interested members of the public. So if you think science is fun, then observing the solar eclipse is just one of the many ways to get involved with NASA science. By participating in these upcoming eclipse-based projects, you can help NASA researchers collect valuable data. Some of the projects happening during the 2024 solar eclipse include Eclipse Mega Movie. If you have a DSLR camera and a tripod, you can join other citizen scientists to record dynamics in the solar corona during the total eclipse. Keep in mind, it's never safe for you or your camera to look directly at the sun. If you decide to work on this project, NASA will give you instructions on how to protect your eyes and your camera from sun damage. Be sure to visit NASA's website for more information. Don't have the correct equipment? Or maybe you're not in the path of totality. Don't worry, you can help analyze the images after the eclipse. Eclipse soundscapes. People have different reactions to viewing eclipses, and animals do too. If you're in the path of totality and you'll be surrounded by animals, NASA wants you to listen for and record those soundscapes. Will the birds stop singing? Will crickets start chirping? Eclipse Soundscapes will revisit an eclipse study from almost 100 years ago that showed that animals and insects are affected by solar eclipses. NASA is looking for people like you to collaborate with them. Citizen scientists have helped make thousands of important scientific discoveries. Be sure to visit NASA's Eclipses and Citizen Science website to learn more. An impending eclipse will be across the entire country. The eclipse will land in Mexico and cross the entire United States, leaving millions in wonder and awe. Are you close to the path of totality? How much of the eclipse will you be able to see? How long will totality last where you are? When does it start? Because you don't want to miss it. Where will you be? We wanted to use shadows to tell the story about the eclipse, which is all about a huge shadow. If you would like to make your own shadow puppet stories, here's how you can try this at home. Shadows are really interesting. On the International Space Station, the temperature can change 400 degrees between light and shadow. Shadows are how we experience eclipses, and they can be a lot of fun to play with. We're going to make a shadow puppet theater. You will need a few simple supplies. A cardboard box, 
thin cardboard like a cereal box or cardstock, tracing paper, an X-Acto knife, scissors, a hole punch, brads, tape, a template for your puppets, or you can draw your own, long skinny sticks, and a light source. Decide what kind of puppet you want to make. We've decided to make a dog. Using the cereal box, we're going to draw our design and cut out the puppet pieces. Next, tape sticks to the back of your puppet. To put the puppet together, punch holes and put brads where the joints are. This will allow the puppets to move. To make your puppet theater, measure the size of your tracing paper and cut a hole in the cardboard box that can be covered by paper. Ask an adult for help if you need to. Our tracing paper is 11 by 14 inches and we've decided to cut an 8 by 10 inch hole. Next, tape your tracing paper over the hole in your cardboard box. Place a light source behind your puppet theater. You can use a flashlight, desk light, or even a bright window. Put your puppet between the light source and the tracing paper. To make your shadow puppet come alive, put your puppet close to the tracing paper, then pull it away to see how the shadows change. Use the sticks to make it move. Once your theater and puppets are created, you can experiment with different designs. Try telling a story with your puppets and look at how the light and shadows interact. Some folks write poetry, some sing songs, and others make art. Alma Thomas was often inspired by the space program, and in 1970, she may have witnessed a total solar eclipse. Later, she produced Eclipse as one of her space paintings. The Eclipse is from her series, Space Paintings, which includes at least 15 works covering topics from rocket launches to sunsets. Thomas found her source of inspiration in daily life, and although we cannot confirm that Thomas saw it, a total solar eclipse was visible in the United States on March 7, 1970. Thomas's bright colors and bold circular patterns give a dynamic tone appropriate for the fleeting drama of a total solar eclipse and the emanating light of the solar corona. Whether you paint, draw, or take pictures, here are some ways that you can make your own eclipse art. Beyond the awe and wonder of an eclipse, do you know what it is? A great excuse to wear awesome glasses. Not only that, but it's also a lot of fun. Here are a few fun ways to view the eclipse.
This is the second total solar eclipse to pass across the United States in the last seven years. In 2017, a total solar eclipse crossed the country, and I got a chance to be in the path of totality. For that eclipse, one of my producers and an astronomy educator from the museum went to Kansas City, Missouri. The school where I used to teach was smack dab in the middle of totality. I got a chance to host the show from there with friends and colleagues. I had seen eclipses before, but not from totality. Before totality, we battled a storm, literally holding down tents. Just before the eclipse started, the clouds went away, and we were able to see the beginning of the eclipse. As the moon slowly covered the sun, it began to get darker and darker. We watched with our glasses, looked at projections of the eclipse, and waited for the big moment. When totality started, someone shouted that you could take off your glasses, and we saw Bailey's beads, where the hills and valleys of the moon allow some light to get through just at the moment of totality. One of my friends took this picture of me during totality. When I saw it the first time, I was surprised at how dark it was when the sun was completely covered. I was completely taken off guard by how emotional the experience would be. It was amazing, and words just left me. I say all of this to encourage you that if you have an opportunity to go to totality, you should go. If you're at 99% and can drive a few miles to make it into the path of totality, do it. Experiencing totality is something that you will never forget, and until you get a chance to experience it, nothing else compares. Beth, back to you. Thanks, Marty. If you're a teacher in the United States, chances are in the coming weeks you'll be discussing the eclipse and we've got you covered. Our teacher tips document helps connect the eclipse to national learning standards, includes links to a bunch of great classroom activities and more additional resources. Getting ready for the eclipse is important, but what about after the eclipse? How do you process with your students what they experienced? What is the historical context? What did it mean to them, and was their experience different from the person standing next to them? Be sure to check out our full post-eclipse discussion guide. The countdown is on. The eclipse is heading your way. We hope this episode has helped you prepare for the eclipse. And we hope that you have a great view of the eclipse and get to experience it safely, no matter where you are. If you like this episode, be sure to follow STEM in 30 on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel. Clear skies.